This week on Motor Week, we've been heavily influenced by the Germans. For your first car, how about the new VW Lupo 1.4S? Fancy something a little flashier? You won't get much more flash than the awesome Mercedes S55 AMG limousine. But if it's out and out size that you need, is the Daimler Chrysler Grand Voyager the one for you? Sometimes you've just got to accept it. Not everything in life can be exciting. Sometimes things are just boring. Like driving the VW Looper, which is boring. I'll explain why. It's not that there's anything immediately and obviously wrong with the Lupo. It's small, it's solid. For a very small car, it is very safe. And it's a VW, so it'll probably be very reliable. But that's it. It doesn't do anything else. And it is a super mini, so it is very, very small. And I don't see the point in that either. Sure, you shave a couple of inches off the back of the thing. Well, what's that going to do? Solve all your inner city parking problems forever? No, I don't think so. And as a result, the boot space. Well, what boot space? And it won't be a surprise to discover that it's not exactly cavernous in here either, particularly if you've got mates you want to put in the back. Oh dear. Because it really is a bit of a squeeze. <laughs> Good grief. And while we're on the subject, VW painting the thing green really doesn't make up for it, even this lurid green. It's a bit like an accountant in a pair of fluorescent socks. You're not fooling anyone, mate. We all know you're boring, really. Somewhere in an office, somebody said, Here, Dave, do us another small car, design it for us, will you? And he turned around and said, Yeah, fine, well, what do you want? Just normal, really. Nothing special. What? You're designing a car, you're spending millions on developing it, and just make it normal. Nothing special. Why? Wouldn't take much more effort, would it? OK, so you could say that not everybody wants an exciting car. Some people want it just to be small and practical and sensible and predictable. Fine. But it ain't cheap. Not by a long way. You're paying well in excess of £8,000 for this version. Now, for that kind of money, you could get, for instance, a Toyota Yaris. Now, there is a car that is small but uses its interior space very intelligently. It's a very clever car. You'd get one for the same cash with a one litre engine, but it's a VVTi, it would be nearly as quick and a lot more practical and a lot more clever. Or if you just want a teeny tiny car, get a Ford car and have a load of money spare. They've certainly managed to make it look very Volkswagen-esque, despite being so small. The protruding bumper at the back is very golfish, and those unadorned flat slab sides, again, very Volkswagen, but none of them very exciting. What I'm not doing is rubbishing the Lupo, because really there is nothing wrong with it. It's actually a very good drive, and for a small car, it feels very solid, as you'd expect, typical VW stuff. It's also not a bad thing to drive. As criticisms go, well, the brakes are a little bit vague and hot hatch fanatics might criticise the steering for not being the most communicative. But hey, it's a city car, and for that, it feels very, very good. In this day and age, we shouldn't have to be grateful for or impressed by things like safety, security and reliability in small cars. We should expect it. These are the basics, the starting point. But what we should demand is something else, something a bit more, something to make it fit in with our lives or excite or interest us. Modern technology means it's perfectly possible to do this. So come on, please, let's have a bit more imagination, a bit more creativity and no more boring boxes. Ah, 
in the golden olden days. Back on Emmerdale, I used to get chauffeured everywhere. Studio to location and then safely back home again. But, you know, it actually wasn't that glamorous at all because it was normally in the back of a local taxi or worse still, rolling around in a minibus. But, you know, if I was a proper actress with film star status and I could demand any limo I wanted in the whole world, I wonder what I'd choose. I would pick this, darling. The S55L AMG. Yes, you would. And with the price tag of a whopping £78,790, I mean, you could buy a house with that. But it does look pretty imposing, doesn't it? With its AMG body styling, massive single-piece alloys and impressive AMG twin exhaust. It looks like the kind of car that you wouldn't mess with. Now, if Mercedes are the daddy of all motor cars, then this, quite frankly, has got to be the godfather. And with it being the long wheelbase, and especially with it being the AMG, it's quite simply marvellous. <laughs> certainly is, and what with the acting work being a bit slow at the moment, it's my job today to drive her ladyship around. But I don't mind really, because in this, I'm going to be king of the road. AMG have been producing high-performance Mercedes-Benz cars for the track and the road for 30 years and produced its first road-going model in 1994, which was the C36 AMG. But what is the point in a sporty limo? Well, that isn't the concept behind AMG. You see, if Mercedes have got a roadster such as the SLK, AMG basically makes it more sporty. But if Mercedes have got a car like a limo, like the S-Class, AMG basically makes it more luxurious and comfortable to ride in. So what was it like back there, love? Well, it's quite simply marvellous, darling, because I'm completely surrounded by leather. And I have to say that the build quality and finish is amongst the best I've seen. Plus, these back seats are individually electrically adjustable and they're heated and... Watch this. And I've got my own vanity mirror with lights. And if there's someone staring in who I don't want to see me, then I've got an electrically controllable roller blind. But I think one of the most amazing things about the back of this car is the space. Because it's a long wheelbase, even when the front seats are pushed right back, I've just got yards and yards of it. Good. Glad you like it. Well, it's pretty nifty up here as well, because as well as everything she's mentioned, we've also got automatic climate control, cruise control, automatic dimming, rear view and side mirrors, a very fancy Bose sound system, and this, which is the cockpit management and navigation system. Under the bonnet, we've got a 5.4 V8 engine with 360 brake horsepower, meaning the 0-60 sprint becomes history after just six seconds. And with a top speed of 155 miles an hour, I'm beginning to wonder about fuel consumption. Hmm. Well, it'll give you a combined return of 21 miles to the gallon. But if you can afford to fork out for a car like this in the first place, I guess you can afford to run it. I mean, the power of this car is unbelievable. You just put your foot down and it goes and it goes. But Mercedes insists that this isn't the main feature of the car. They say that the ride has got to be experienced to be believed. And it's true. You see, it's fitted with a very high-tech air suspension, and this means that when it's on the motorway, it's very supple and relaxing to drive in. But when you're on the narrow country lanes, it's very nimble and agile, so the car adjusts to the driving condition. But one thing is absolutely assured, whatever the road is like, you're going to get a very comfortable ride. What's it like back there, love? Well, I have to say that I'm not aware of any bumps or bends in the roads. I think your driving's first rate. <laughs> well, I'm not sure about that, but one thing is for certain, it will iron out any chauffeur's faults seamlessly. Are we there now? 
you know, I really don't want to get out. It's so nice in here. But we all have our premieres and social events that we have to go to. Or do we? You know, I'd much rather be in the comfort of my Mercedes. Uh, home, James. And don't spare the horses. Boy, yeah, that's lucky. Never thought she'd say that. Ta-ra! That's it for part one, but after the break, Glenda gets lost inside the cavernous Chrysler Voyager and Ian Royal goes French for his used car tip. Now we all know that across the pond, the Americans like to build their cars a little bit on the large side. Whereas we drive around in our MX-5s and our MGFs, the American equivalent of a little runaround is a massive 5.7 Corvette or Camaro. It's madness! But it's not just the sports cars that the Americans like in big proportions. Oh no! So you get your cutesy little European MPV, you put it in the gym for a couple of months, feed it on a high protein diet, give it loads of extra apple pie, then after all that you put a couple of square metres of extra metal on the back and eventually you end up with this, the Chrysler Grand Voyager. And with a name like that, it's transport worthy of Captain James T. Cook. Beat me up, Scotty. This has got to be one of the biggest things on the road. The regular Voyager is big enough, but the Grand Voyager is so big, it means that each one comes with its own postcode. Another great trait that the Americans like is for their cars to have toys. But with this thing, the games start before they even get inside the car. You. Me? Yes, you. Tired of the hassle of opening car doors yourself? Well, be tired no more with the new Chrysler Voyager electric door opening. Yeah, I know, I know. I think it's pretty pointless as well. But you're going to impress the heck out your neighbours. Now... Still bored of opening those doors by hand? <laughs> you again. It's more impressive than the last one. Go on then, if you must. No more fiddling with shopping and chipping those nails with the back of this mama. Simply press the button and the boot is your oyster. <laughs> and because this is the Grand Voyager, you get an extra 13 inches of boot space. And us girlies like the sound of that. No American giant would be complete without a gas-guzzling engine and something this size needs more than two litres. So what else would you do but go for a whopping 3.3 litre V6? It sounds great, not that it matters in an MPV, and it does pull the Voyager along quite nicely, but you will pay for it at the pumps, with a fuel return of just over 22 to the gallon. The driving position in this car is excellent and the forward visibility is superb and of course there's loads of room up front. Once you actually start driving, you forget just how big this car is, but all you need to do to remind yourself how big it is, is look behind you. Hiya! Hiya! With a car designed for long haul drives across America, it copes remarkably well with the twists and turns of England's finest B roads but its forte is sitting on the motorway. Bang the cruise control on, heat up the seats, adjust the aircon, put on an American driving rock CD, check your compass, and you could literally drive all day in this thing and still feel relaxed at the end of it. And you'll need to be, because when it comes to parking the Voyager, it's an absolute nightmare, and it's enough to put anybody's stress levels up. I mean, if you thought any car needed parking sensors, it was this one. But no, it leaves you to go in blind with no 
idea where the four corners of the vehicles are. As relaxing a ride as this is, it's far more fun to be shuttled around in the back of one of these. The variety of seating positions and luggage options is enough to keep the most attentive of TV presenters happy for hours, with almost every nook and cranny having space for some family heirloom or a giant cup of coffee. Plus, you can even give yourself a coffee table, if Madame so desires. Ah, riding in the back of one of these makes you feel very, very important, relaxed, and really rather luxurious. But one of the things that the Americans do struggle with is their interiors. I mean, there's so much beige in here, it makes me feel like I'm at a geography teacher's convention. And the materials on the dash are as plastic as they come, and they feel very cheap. We criticise the Japanese for bland interiors, but at least they feel as if they won't fall apart after 200 miles. Give the US leather seats, big engines and toys, and they're happy. Simple as that. And because this car is so big, the poor interior doesn't detract from the sense of occasion it gives you. But at 29 grand, it's five grand more expensive than the top of the range Ford Galaxy. But it's bigger, it's flasher. And at the end of the day, which car would you rather be driven round Hollywood in? It's big. It's very big. It's a monster. Now this week I'm looking at value for money motoring, firstly a car that is cheap to buy and secondly one that offers brilliant, absolutely brilliant fuel economy and it's this, the Citroen AX. Drive through the streets of any major city in France and they'll be teeming with Citroen AXs, most of which will certainly have seen plenty of life. The French don't look after their cars like we tend to do and these cars are definitely built to last. Now Citroen launched the AX way back in 1987 and they sold millions and millions across Europe. It had one facelift in 1991 and continued life until 96. If you like basic no-frills motoring, then the AX could be just the car for you. This AX has got very little on it to be honest, not even central locking. What it has got is an economical 1.5 diesel engine, only 58 brake horsepower, but pay £28 to fill the tank and it'll go for 500 miles. Now even I can't argue with that. With regular changes for oil, coolant and the cam belt, this block will go on and on and on. Now the AX is a very light car and you could say it's, well, to be honest, somewhat tinny, so it does tend to dent very easily on the bodywork. So check all around for signs of any blemishes and do check hard because they can be difficult to spot. OK, you can repair them, but it just adds extra cost. And in true French style, the AX also gets some rather interesting things in the doors. Pockets here, which will hold properly a bottle of wine. Just add a string of onions and a beret for true Gallic style. for the Citroen AX, whilst hardly great, is perfectly acceptable. It's fine on motorways despite its lack of power, but it does start to get a touch out of shape on twisty sections of roads. Insurance shouldn't be a problem either. This 1.5 diesel is a Group 6 and the base 1 litre a Group 3. Our price guide for an AX looks like this. A 1.1 AX three-door on a K-plate with 50,000 miles, £1,200. A 1995 NREG AX Elation one litre with 60,000 miles, £1,400. The mildly sporty AX GT on a J-plate with 80,000 miles for a grand. 
diesel AXs hold their value well. Expect to pay nearly £3,000 for a later model 1.5 diesel or around £2,500 for this AX. Now this AX belongs to one of our producers, Rob, and he, in four years of ownership, has had no problems with it. It's always started first time, and 500 miles on a tank full of diesel can't be argued with. Its shape, well, it's beginning to look a bit dated now, certainly up against its replacement, the Saxo, but that costs a lot more. So this week's used car tip is the Citroen AX diesel. On next week's Motor Week, we're focusing on performance with a three-way GTI test, plus a look at Seat Cibitha Type R. See you next week.